invite you, well rested you, tired you, lost you, restless you, comfortable you, overjoyed you, and weary you into worship today. May these words and songs of worship draw us together at a time when we are physically and spiritually divided. May you know whatever you carry with you today is fully embraced by the faithful God who gives us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow.
Welcome to Worship at Wilshire. We are so glad you've taken the time to join us. We are grateful for the technology that enables us to gather together while staying apart and keeping one another safe and healthy through this global pandemic. Our church will meet in person again someday. And in the words of one of my mom's favorite hymns, when we all get together, what a day of rejoicing that will be. So here we are. And Frankly, what other time are you going to get to go to church in your pajamas? Our building is empty, but our church parking lot is very busy. Starting tonight through the fall, our children will gather in person on the north parking lot for a time of music, mission study, and Bible skills training. You know, the programs we normally do on Wednesday nights. Please look at the Tapestry newsletter or online for information on registration and what your child needs and what the church is doing to maintain your child's safety during this time together every week. Next Sunday, September 19th, the church will be offering flu shots on the North parking lot. Uh, registration forms are online uh, with information on cost and insurance. Um, be mindful that getting our flu shot this season may be more critical than at any other time thanks to the pandemic. The kitchen isn't getting cold either. On Wednesdays, the Koinonia Cafe to Go will be continuing to offer lunches. Um, you go online on Tuesday evening, pick up from a menu of items and pay, and you'll get instructions on where to pick up your Wednesday meal. This helps us defray the cost of keeping the kitchen staff on the job and keeping them employed. Uh, we're grateful that they served 147 meals last week and glad that the church has come together to help us during this time. Thank you for joining us. Now let's continue to worship. It's my pleasure to make a couple of introductions to you this morning. Uh, I want you to meet uh, two of our new interns here at Wilshire, uh, Leah Lucas, who is going to be working in student ministry, and Trent Juarez, who will be working in uh, young adult ministry. Uh, here at Wilshire with us. So uh, welcome, Leah. Welcome, Trent. Uh, delighted to have you guys working with us um, and excited for you to get to introduce yourselves a little bit to the congregation. Uh, so to start with, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you're from, some education background, maybe where you are in your studies uh, now. Um, Leah, let's start with you. Yeah. So I'm Leah Lucas. I am from Kaufman, Texas. Um, it's about 35 minutes southeast of Dallas. I attended Hardin-Simmons University for undergrad where I focused on ministry and psychology. And I began my Master of Divinity last August at Logston Seminary. And when it announced its closure in February, I transferred over to Perkins and I started my second year of my master's in August. Fantastic. How about you? Um, yeah, my name is Trent Juarez. I was born in El Paso, um, but a, a, since about the age of eight, I think, I've lived in the DFW area. Um, I went to Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, graduated with my music education degree, 
Um, and now I'm here at Perkins with Leah, super excited about that in my second year um, as a Master of Divinity student. And I'm really looking forward to the really amazing work that um, we'll get to be a part of um, as Wilshire continues to journey through this um, crazy time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I mentioned uh, generally, uh, Leah, you'll be working with uh, student ministry and Trent uh, in young adults. Um, I wonder if you want to tell us a little more uh, specifics about kind of what you'll be doing um, in those areas. And, uh, Leah, we'll go ahead and start with you again. So I'll be helping in general with youth events. And then on Sunday mornings, I'll be jumping in with the ninth and 10th grade class and helping lead their Sunday school class. And then during the week, I'm going to help create an outreach slash in reach and focus on connecting with our students during this pandemic and when we're separated and we can't see each other face to face. So I'll be working on that program and figuring out how best to reach students. Great. Trent, what are you going to be up to? Yeah, so I'm going to be the um, new um, young adult intern here at Wilshire. Um, and we're basically looking to grow and cultivate community um, in hopefully new and creative ways. Um, this is a time where people are um, facing um, hardships and burdens, but there's also a lot of opportunities for growth and renewed connections. Um, and so we're looking forward to leaning into virtual opportunities, um, other creative ways to have fellowship, and to talk about what does this crazy life of faith look like in a crazy time? Um, what do we do when we're apart from each other? Um, and basically trying to ask as young adults journeying farther into our lives, um, what are the new things that God is gonna do in the world and in our lives? So yeah, that's pretty much it. That sounds great. Um, so I think something that uh, people would like to know is basically, how did you find your way to Wilshire? How did you end up here? Uh, give us a little bit uh, of, of the connection that, that brought you to Wilshire. Leah, we'll go ahead. So my mentor, okay. My mentor at Hardin Simmons helped me get connected with Wilshire. And then I've had some friends who've gone through the pastoral residency program and who have interned at Wilshire. So I have a couple of different connections to how I came to Wilshire. Great. And what about you? Yeah, so I, I, I have a um, not a long history with Wilshire, but um, have been acquainted with it for some time. And it's really been um, a gem in my life and the lives of others. Um, I, I think I primarily got to know the Wilshire community actually through um, Dr. Jamie Clark Souls, who is a professor of New Testament here at Perkins. Um, and through her connections with people like yourself, and George Mason and other students at Perkins um, and the community that those two have helped create with um, the Baptist House of Studies at Perkins School of Theology, which often works in conjunction with Wilshire. Um, that was pretty much how I got to know the community. Um, I'm actually a member at Royal Lane Baptist Church. And um, I think a lot of us in, in both of those church communities would like to think of Wilshire and Royal Lane as kind of kindred spirits in the Dallas community. Um, and then through people like you, Darren, and other um, staff and clergy at Wilshire, um, it's just been continued gift and gift and blessing to get to know the community. So that's great. Well, we are really looking forward to both of you uh, being around with us and, uh, you know, look forward to being able to bump into you whenever we're actually able to do those types of things again around here. Um, We've mentioned a couple of times just the, the weirdness that is now, this time that we're living in. So a uh, final question for each of you is, uh, you know, what does it feel like? What is it like to be starting a new position like this uh, in a time when we can't really be together as community and as when we are having to deal with separation? So uh, what's that uh, been like and, and how do you feel like you're going to be able to kind of navigate through that? Um, I definitely think it's difficult to start a new position when I haven't really met anyone at Wilshire. And so I think ministry is a lot about connections and getting to know people in person and know their stories. And so that's a little bit different now that we're doing this over Zoom or very socially distanced with our mask on. So my hope is that 
in the coming weeks, I get to meet a few more people and help um, when I'm forming those connections, kind of get to know different people within the congregation and how they might be able to help the youth ministry, but also so that I can form personal connections, meet more people than what I have now. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's a, it's an uncertain time in ways, but uh, I, for one, believe that a lot of times, uncertain times are the times where God's good work kind of um, shocks and amazes us the most. So while it is uncertain, um, like Leah, I'm really looking forward to new and innovative opportunities for ministry, for worship, and to get to know who people are, where they are, and what does church look like in a time like this and past a time like this? And what are the ways that maybe rather than only focusing on the lament of what has passed, what are the ways that we can reach into the future and again, engage with the new things that God is doing and um, the abundant life that we share in community and with Christ? That sounds great. Well, again, welcome officially uh, to you, Leah, and to you, Trent. Uh, even though it may feel uh, a bit distant of a welcome as we're, again, are having to talk over screens. But we look forward to uh, getting to do ministry with you over the next year and uh, excited about seeing where that goes. So thanks for joining us this morning, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yes, hope to see you guys soon. Definitely glad to be here. This morning's epistle reading is from Romans. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Do you pray with me? Most gracious God, the scripture reminds us this morning that whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. All of us are yours. Most gracious God, with boldness, I pray for a freedom that releases us from the persistent need to judge both ourselves and those around us. May our lives reflect the outpouring of grace extended to each of us. And when we fail, forgive us. 77 times. Most merciful God, we confess to you this morning that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We acknowledge our need of you. While you desire our entirety and not just our worship, prayers, or attendance, we confess we have not loved you with our whole selves. Forgive us for living as if our best exists in incompleteness. And when we fail, forgive us 77 times. Most just God, we confess to you the moments we have not loved our neighbors or cared for your world or received your people in friendship. Challenge us where we are unjust, disturb us when we don't care and transform our selfishness. May we embody a way other than our own. And when we fail, forgive us 77 times. Most compassionate God, in your presence this morning, we call to mind all whom are in need of your mercy and grace. And for those in our community of faith, whom are in need of your healing touch and presence in these days, we pray. For Dale, Bob, Anne, Steve, Carlita, Pam, and Natalie. 
And for those in our community of faith whom are grieving a loss, would you wrap them in your overwhelming peace? We pray for the Hill family and the loss of their uncle, Chuck. Most loving God, would you meet us this morning in the exact ways in which we need you? And would you lead us to experience your peace and chaos, light and darkness, love and hate? God, forgive us. Christ, befriend us. And the Spirit, change and renew our lives forevermore. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Yeah. 
I was born in 1956, one year before the Russians launched the Sputnik satellite that sent the United States into a frenzied Cold War with the Soviet Union. America was panicked that the Soviets were ahead of us in the space race. And we were convinced that one of the reasons for that was that they were more advanced in teaching mathematics. So in response, we developed the so-called new math. Now, in the old math, you did a lot of memorizing, multiplication tables. You just knew that, oh, let's say pick a number out of the air, 70 times 7. Well, that would be 490. Okay, so maybe we didn't memorize the 70s table, but we knew that 7 times 7 is 49, and then add a 0 for the 10. Well, now I'm doing the new math, you understand. The, the basic idea is that you shouldn't just compute the numbers, but you should try to understand what they mean, what their values are, and what they symbolize. The new math is long since discredited, roundly thought to be too complicated. Much better to let the kids just get straight to the answer as quickly as possible rather than having them understand the logic behind it also. In fact, nowadays, the phrase, the new math, is used for anything anyone claims to be true but just doesn't add up. Today we begin a three-part sermon series I'm calling Accounting Standards. In the next few weeks, we will look at three passages from Matthew's Gospel that all have some connection to how we reconcile our relationships with God and one another. Today's story lays out whether Forgiveness and mercy or sin and punishment will be the standard by which we balance our accounts. Our text comes right after Jesus has told us that when relationships are broken in the church, we should set as quickly as possible to the task of restoring them. The process he lays out is designed to bring us back into right relationships. But Peter then poses the question to Jesus about how often we should forgive. See, in those times, some believed you might forgive three times. But the fourth time, you shouldn't forgive, lest the chronic sinner lose all motivation to change. This is religion's version of the old math. You keep score. And Peter plays into this by doubling down on the tradition and making the three into six plus one, and that gets him to the spiritual number of seven. He's probably proud of himself, sensing that Jesus is more merciful than the prophet Amos, who laid out for us the three times rule. But Peter is still doing bookkeeping. 
Jesus employs the new math. He says we should forgive 70 times seven. Now, some scholars think the number should be 70 plus seven or 77 times, which is possible also in the translation. Either way, the point is the same, stop counting. If you're counting the number of times you will forgive someone, you aren't really counting forgiveness. You are biding your time until you can get to your real aim, which is judgment. Christianity always lives within the tension of forgiveness and judgment. The question is, which is the true standard by which God reckons with us? Is judgment the ruling standard and then forgiveness the possibility for those who are truly repentant? Or is forgiveness the standard and judgment the outcome for those who fail to live by the standard of forgiveness? You can see how these two approaches show up in the way our churches operate. Do our membership policies begin with exclusion and end with inclusion of only those who qualify? Or do they begin with inclusion and only exclude those who refuse to live according to the terms of always open to all? Hmm, there's a nice phrase for a church. Well, Jesus tells a parable to clarify. A certain servant is caught red-handed owing a sum of 10,000 talents. We don't know how that can be. Maybe he was the head of the king's treasury department because the amount is astronomical. It would have exceeded the combined taxes of Syria, Phoenicia, Judea, and Samaria. It's a ridiculous sum. Zillions, we might say. The point is that it's unfathomable and unpayable. So the servant falls on his face and begs the king to give him time to pay up. Of course, no amount of time would be enough. The king knows this and surprisingly responds with compassion. He forgives the debt entirely. No strings attached. This is the gospel. God does not reckon our sins against us. Forgiveness is the rule, not the exception to the rule. Mercy is the nature of God whose character is defined by the law of love, not the love of law. Which is to say, if you are despairing about the state of your soul today, if you are worried that your sins are so grievous that you can never atone for them in your lifetime, listen to Jesus. Grace is greater than all your sin. The marvelous, matchless grace of our loving Lord, as the hymn puts it, is the basis for your relationship to God. As Frederick Buechner beautifully says it, grace is something you can never get, but can only be given. There is no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. This is why the whole idea of Christians engaging in culture wars that exclude or marginalize or cancel people because they don't conform in conduct or belief or opinion or worse, identity, is so unseemly. The grace of God doesn't figure. By its nature, it's extravagant and incalculable. It doesn't say do this or be that before you are accepted or loved or welcomed in the arms of God. And to show how true that is, Jesus continues. 
after being shown inexplicable mercy by the king, the first servant, who has been forgiven much, comes immediately upon a servant of his, who is indebted to him by an amount that equals about a hundred days labor. The second debtor falls on his face and begs patience in exactly the same way the first debtor did with the king who forgave him. But instead of doing the same as had been done for him, the forgiven servant refuses to forgive the lesser debtor. He has, he has him thrown into prison, which is ironic to me because when you're in a debtor's prison, you can't work to earn anything to pay back anything. Punishment never leads to restoration. When fellow servants hear what has happened, they report the incident to the king. The king summons the man he has forgiven and hands that man over to the torturers so until he can pay the original debt that has been forgiven. The fellow servants get the king's intent that mercy rule his kingdom. They know that if this ungrateful first servant gets away with his unmerciful behavior toward the second, it will ruin the whole calculus of the community. See, the problem in the church is not as some charge that there's no accountability or as others charge that there's too much accountability. It's that the church's accountability is based on the wrong accounting standard. Here we see a key teaching of the church. We are not judged by God on the basis of our sin. We are judged on the basis of our forgiveness. What rules our relationships? If we worry about doing something wrong, we are perpetually insecure. But if we realize that sin doesn't determine our relationships, we are secure. It's not that Doing things God's way makes you unaccountable. It's that it makes you accountable to living God's way. God's way is the way of the new math, the way of counting the big forgiveness first and applying it to all the smaller offenses that we have with one another. Now, my grandkids are learning to add differently than I did. They compute from left to right, whereas I learned to add from right to left. They learn from the larger numbers to the smaller, whereas I learned the other way around, which involved lots of carryovers to the 10 columns. We do too much carrying over of our smaller debts to one another. We note them and we nurse them, enjoying the righteous indignation of feeling superior as the one who has been offended. It gives us a false sense of power. I have felt that powerful feeling of unforgiveness before and true confessions, there are some people I still feel that way toward today. And to tell you the truth, I'm pretty annoyed that I have to preach this passage to you because unless I'm content to be a hypocrite, I have to let it go. Which is exactly what the word forgive means, don't you know? Let go. True power is the power to forgive, not the power to punish. This is what we learn from the king in Jesus' parable. 
And the problem with holding on to your anger and bitterness against someone else, it's that it's like a leash. There are two ends to the tether. You may think you are holding someone accountable, but you are being held by it as much as the other. True freedom comes from letting go of whatever it is that has come between you, even if the other person hasn't begged you for forgiveness. The problem with the unforgiving servant is that he was still adding right to left. He quickly forgot the enormous debt that was forgiven him and therefore failed to see himself in the man who was indebted to him. When you see yourself in the person you are holding accountable, you realize how you've been in that position before, before God, and you have been forgiven, and then you can't do anything but forgive. Or, or you yourself will suffer the consequences of your unforgiveness. The eloquent preaching professor Tom Long puts his finger on it pitch perfectly. When one gets a sense of proportion then, a sense of the size of our sinful debt and the immensity of God's mercy, no one would dare attempt to ration forgiveness. We know too well that the little boat in which we are sailing is floating on a deep sea of grace and that forgiveness is not to be dispensed with an eyedropper, but a fire hose. Fire away, church. Let's let grace loose on each other. Let's let forgiveness be our accounting standard, since apparently that's God's way of reckoning with us. Amen. Well, the ushers are coming up the aisles now to receive our morning offering. Oh, well, not really. Um, but uh, they're appealing to you now through my voice to say, you can give wherever you are. And we do encourage you to do so. Week by week, we still have many expenses as a church and we're trying to keep things going in the highest level possible of ministry. And in order to do so, we need your contribution. So would you go at this time to wilshirebc.org forward slash give and contribute? Uh, you can send a check, of course, to the church's physical address or uh, handle it in some other way. Call the church office and arrange for your giving on a monthly basis from your checking account. Whatever the case, please be generous and please contribute. If you're part of our community or you're wanting to endorse our community's ministries and our approach to doing church in the world, we, we would appreciate any of your contributions, whether you are a member or not. And on that note, uh, we have no new members to announce today, and I would love to be able to say to you uh, next week that someone has joined us. So if that someone is you, uh, you can email me at pastor at wilshirebc.org, and I'd love to be able to uh, talk with you via email or phone, and we'll be able uh, to discuss the way in which you can become part of the Wilshire community. Whether you live here in Dallas or anywhere else, uh, there's a way for you to be a member and to participate in our church's life. I do have an announcement to make that decreases our church membership this week by one. Walton Stewart died uh, this week on Wednesday, and Walton was the last remaining charter member of Wilshire Baptist Church. He was just a teenager when his family was part of the group that gathered to organize Wilshire, and he was a good soul who uh, remained faithful all these 69 plus years of the church's life. 
and we mourn his passing and the passing of an era, really, as we think about those faithful servants of God who made forgiveness uh, the touchstone of what it meant to be part of a community like this. And it has been a beautiful journey, and we remember Walton and give thanks for his kind uh, that uh, gave us this kind of church that we celebrate today. Uh, so condolences to his family and to our whole church family on his passing. I do wanna say that we have a celebration of new life that I think some of you would love to know about because one of our former pastoral residents, Kevin Gardner Sinclair and his wife, Nora, uh, are serving in Louisville, Kentucky now. Uh, Kevin is the pastor at Broadway Baptist Church, but they had a little boy this week. Uh, his name is Henry Truman Gardner Sinclair and they're calling him Hank. So congratulations to them and we celebrate the gift of this new life. And now receive this benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with and upon you all now and forever. Amen. making all things new, a promise that we know is true. Through eyes of faith we long to see a love transformed community, a place where truth and justice reign and healing triumphs over